Wednesday Chapel with the, our preschool every year. And so when we were driving in the car earlier today, I asked Logan, hey, what is Ash Wednesday about? Why do we do Ash Wednesday? And he said, Ash Wednesday is a special day when we get a stamp that shows that we love God. And I thought, you know what? That's pretty good. <laughs> um, Lent is not a season that is practiced by every church, and so some folks know about it and some don't. And um, what it, its intent um, has for over a thousand years, 1,500 years, is that we have known as part of the human nature for a long time that from time to time we need to set aside time where we can just stop running from ourselves and confront ourselves. And that's kind of what Jesus had to do in the wilderness for his 40 days at the beginning of his ministry. When you go out into the wilderness, there's nothing else there, and that's the reason you go there is because you have to confront the only thing you brought into the wilderness, which is yourself. Um, and so Lent is an intentional wilderness kind of time uh, that we provide uh, that the church provides um, for each one of us, the hope being that we use it as a time to kind of reorient ourselves back uh, to Christ. And so Ash Wednesday is the very beginning of that season. Um, and ashes have been used uh, since the uh, Old Testament times as a sign of confession and repentance and a reminder to ourselves that God is God and we are not that we are dust and will return to dust, and that God ultimately is the one in charge. And so I am really grateful that you took the time out of your week to join us tonight. We're going to do a service a little bit differently tonight. Um, we're doing a covenant service, which has been part of the Methodist tradition for, well, since the 18th century. Um, and so we're using Ash Wednesday as a time to say, Today is the day when we are going to remember the covenant God has made with us and to um, rededicate ourselves to that covenant with the Lord. And so you will see um, a lot of that in your bulletin tonight. Don't worry, it doesn't take too long. But the words really are powerful if you let them be. And so I um, invite you into kind of a contemplative, reflective time tonight. Um, and as we try to clear the space in our lives and in our minds and hearts, then it becomes easier for us to hear from God. Um, so will you join with me um, bowing your heads as we open tonight in prayer? O oh God, searcher of all our hearts, you have formed us as a people and claimed us for your own. As we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and grace, and to enter anew into covenant with you. Reveal any reluctance or falsehood within us. Let your spirit impress your truth on our inmost being and receive us in mercy for the sake of our mediator, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. If you would please stand as Abel and join us in singing.
And now a prayer of thanksgiving. If the congregation will repeat the words that appear on the slide when they appear. Let us give thanks for all God's mercies. O oh God, our covenant friend, you have been gracious to us through all the years of our lives. We thank you for your loving care, which has filled our days and brought us to this time and place. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You have given us life and reason and set us in a world filled with your glory. You have comforted us with family and friends and ministered to us through the hands of our sisters and brothers. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You have filled our hearts with a hunger after you and have given us your peace. You have redeemed us and called us to a high calling in Jesus Christ. You have given us a place in the fellowship of your spirit and the witness of your church. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You have been our light in darkness and a rock of strength in adversity and temptation. You have been the very spirit of joy in our joys and the all-sufficient reward in all our labors. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You remembered us when we forgot you. You followed us even when we tried to flee from you. You met us with forgiveness when we returned to you. For all your patience and overflowing grace, we praise your holy name, O oh God. Going deep with the Lord always begins with thanksgiving. It always begins with us calling to mind all that we have to be grateful for to the Lord. Um, and so I want to give you an opportunity to share in that in a special kind of way tonight. Um, go ahead and grab your phones, if you will. And we're going to go to this website, menti.com. When you get there, type in that code. If you can't see it, I'll read it off for you. It's 16 30 66. So go to 
www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then use the code 163066. And when you do, you'll see this slide that's coming up here. Name some things for which you are very grateful to God that you often forget to say thank you for. So I want you to take a second and to go ahead and reflect on a few things for which you are very grateful, but that you don't always remember to be thankful for in your prayers. Take a moment and we'll, we'll see, we'll be able to share with one another um, all the things for which we have to say thanks. we are grateful that we don't always remember to say thank you for freedom a roof over my head my family's health forgiveness the grace of God challenges my past struggles Finances, <laughs> I like that one, it just says my life. <laughs> we sometimes forget that, don't we? The, um, the larger the word, the more people said it. So that's how you see that there. Good health and doctors, children, mom, dad, breath. My pets. <laughs> mm. For these, Lord, and many, many other things, the thousands of things for which we often are completely oblivious, we do give you the little thing that we have to give you, which is our thanks and our gratitude, Lord. You are so, so good to us. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming and for dying and for your sacrifice for us, that we can have eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. 
They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What percentage of Americans would you guess have at least one tattoo? Mm -hmm. Hmm? 45, 50, 75. I'm hearing some high numbers. The percentage of Americans that has at least one tattoo. 30%, which is up 9% in the last eight years. Now, I don't have any myself, uh, mostly because I'm afraid of needles, but what my friends who have one tell me is that each tattoo has a meaning. It commemorates a special time in their life. It has a specific Um, statement about who they are. It has a purpose to them. One tattoo might have to do with military service. Um, Another tattoo has to do with their faith. Maybe your tattoo was necessary for your radiation treatment for breast cancer. Perhaps for someone else, their tattoo calls to mind a particular beach vacation when an impulsive decision was made that you just as soon forget. But a tattoo is a choice. It's a decision. And once it's made, it becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of who you are. By design, it is inseparable from you. It's never not a part of you. Tattoos of a certain sort are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, you just heard about it. Did you catch it? When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they make it all the way back to that holy mountain, Mount Sinai, and their lives with God are finally really going to begin. They've made it through the Red Sea, they've gotten manna down from heaven and water from the rock, and now they receive the most important thing of all, the covenant. Exodus 
chapter 19. God says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I lifted you up on eagles' wings and brought you to me. So now, if you faithfully obey me and stay true to my covenant, you will be my most precious possession out of all the peoples, since the whole earth belongs to me. And in verse 8, the people all responded with one voice, Everything that the Lord has said, we will do. And that's when they received the Ten Commandments, the guidelines of the covenant, the boundaries of their relationship with God. This is what it looks like to be in relationship with me. You will have no other gods before me. You will not say my name in vain. You will practice the Sabbath. You will not lie, and so on and so forth. And that covenant was inscribed, do you remember, on two stone tablets, yes. And they were placed in a holy place, a special place, the tabernacle and then later the temple. They knew where the tablets were, but they were over there in that place, not here with me. And what God saw time and time again through the Old Testament, and you'll see it too as you read through it, was that because the covenant was not with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they often forgot about it. They didn't live up to the covenant. They discarded it. Because it was with them sometimes, but not all the time, they were separable from it, not inseparable. And so in that Jeremiah passage that Diane just read for us, God said something new. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant, not like the one with your ancestors that they broke, but the one, not the one I made with Moses, but this new covenant, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Rather than the covenant being written on a couple of tablets that can then be stored in a storeroom for safekeeping, God is going to write the covenant on the heart. We'll tattoo our hearts with what it means to be in relationship with God Almighty. Not a tattoo on the skin, but all the way deep down into the very tissue of our hearts. In other words, to the core, to the very deepest place within us. We have that covenant. We saw the covenant live a life in the person of Jesus Christ. And ever since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit brought what it means to be in relationship with God into our very hearts. And if the Holy Spirit is within us, then we have that covenant tattooed on our hearts, though sometimes it might seem invisible. We have a proper understanding of what it means to be in relationship with God. It's in here. But I don't know about you, but our hearts are pretty busy places. There is a lot going on in here. And for many of us, our our hearts are graffitied. Now, I love graffiti, actually. It's beautiful art. But that's not the kind that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about more of like the mess and litter, layer on top of layer. And these other things on our hearts are not tattoos. No, they are things that we have been branded with. Think for a moment about the difference between a tattoo and a brand. When a person is branded, like uh, the Holocaust victims who had the numbers written on their arms, it is against their will. It's not a marking that they want. It is a mark of shame. A tattoo, on the other hand, is a choice. A brand is against your will. And friends, I believe that if we take a close look at our hearts, we will find that for many of us, we have been branded with unhelpful labels, part of the sin of life and the way in which we have been sinned against. That paper heart that you were given when you walked in, can you find that? You see that paper heart? And were you given a little pencil too? Not inside the heart, but around the outside of the heart. I want you to take a minute and pencil some of the words 
that maybe you have been branded with in your life. Perhaps they're words like um, a cheater, or lazy, or a bad parent, or cheap, or uncaring, or an addict, or whatever. Take a moment to write down the sins that give you the most trouble. Whatever words have been applied to you, or that you have unwillingly applied to yourself, that bring you a sense of shame. Take a second to do that. And the beautiful thing, the life-changing thing, the saving thing, is that God wants to inscribe something new on your heart. And in fact, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that covenant is already there. Though at times it might be hard to remember it or see it, it might feel kind of invisible. God does not want to brand you. It's a tattoo. It has to be your choice. You have to want that kind of relationship with the Lord. But he needs to find some room on your heart to write the covenant. And if we have it cluttered with all of this junk that has been laid on top of us over the years, then it's very hard for that covenant to shine through. You know, then we got to the passage that Mark read to us from the Gospel of John. Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and I'll remain in you. And we like those words. We love those words. That's part of our discipleship pathway. We begin at come and see and then follow me and then be with me. And then finally, on this night, the night before he dies, whenever he says those words that were just read, he says, remain in me. This idea that we can get to the point in our relationship with God that we remain in him constantly and he in us. But then there's that other part of that passage that is way more intimidating. Did you notice it? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And then in verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Seems kind of odd place there. Our secret hope is, I think, that once we accept Christ, that he'll leave us alone. (laughs) That that acceptance is the thing that he wanted, the only thing he wanted, and after we give it to him, he'll, he'll back off a little bit. We're done. Jesus says, though, that we're all getting cut. Either we get cut off or we get pruned, trimmed. We get cut off when there's no spiritual fruit in our lives, when we enjoy the sin we're living in, when there's no evidence of spiritual growth, when we want Jesus as a convenient savior, but not as a master. But even for those of us who want the God life and are doing our best to live faithfully every day and to be in tune with the spirit, even we get pruned. And what is it in us that gets pruned? Our sin, yes, the sin we feel like sticks out like a scarlet letter to the eyes of God and maybe to everybody else too, but also the other things, the ways that we've been sinned against, the shame that others have tried to impose on us. We want to be free and clear of these things in order for God to have his way in our lives. We cannot be branded by the sins of our past, if we're going to pioneer the way into God's future. Amen? And did you notice what Jesus said? You are already clean. You're already clean. You don't have to get yourself right before you come to me. You don't have to stay branded. Let God's covenant inscribed, tattooed on your heart take the place of all those other sins and sources of shame that have been littering it. Okay, so we came full service tonight. We had paper hearts, we had pencils, but we also had scissors. 
You see those scissors? In a chair near you, pull those scissors out. And whenever you're ready tonight, I want to invite you to cut off the words that you wrote on your card. Those are the things that God wants to prune from your heart. The things that are not helping you, the things that are keeping you from being able to live fully into God's intention for you. These things that other people have placed on you but are not of God and that have no place in God's future for your life. Cut them, prune them off so that you can thrive. Tonight, you're going to be given the opportunity to renew your covenant with the Lord. You don't have to participate. You can just listen. I'm totally happy with that. But if you are to a place where you feel ready to confess, which we all have to do on a regular basis, if you're ready to be clean, if you're ready to wipe the slate clean and prune your heart of all those things that have been branded on it. If you're ready to remember what that covenant is that God has inscribed on your heart, then I do encourage you to participate uh, tonight. And so turn to your bulletin. We printed these words in here because we want you to have an opportunity to go back and reference them. My words will be... Um, in the regular font, and your words are in the bold. And if you feel like you're at that place in your spiritual life, then I encourage you um, to participate in this covenant renewal service with me. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. But then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Let us, therefore, go to Christ and pray. Let me be your servant under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and work. Lord, make me what you will. I put myself fully into your hands. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Christ will be the savior of none but his servants. He is the source of all salvation to those who obey. Christ will have no servants except by consent. That's the thing about it has to be our will, right? Christ will not accept anything except full consent to all that he requires. Christ will be all in all, or he will be nothing. Confirm this by a holy covenant. To make this covenant a reality in your life, listen to these admonitions. First, set apart some time more than once to be spent alone before the Lord and seeking earnestly God's special assistance and gracious acceptance of you and carefully thinking about all the conditions of the covenant and searching your hearts whether you have already freely given your life to Christ. Consider what your sins are. 
Consider the laws of Christ, how holy, strict, and spiritual they are, and whether you, after having carefully considered them, are willing to choose them all. Be sure you are clear in these matters. See that you do not lie to God. Second, be serious and in a spirit of holy awe and reverence. Third, claim God's covenant. Rely upon God's promise of giving grace and strength so that you can keep your promise. Trust not your own strength and power. Fourth, resolve to be faithful. You have given to the Lord your hearts. You have opened your mouths to the Lord and you have dedicated yourself to God. With God's power, never go back. And last, be then prepared to renew your covenant with the Lord. Fall down on your knees. Lift your hands toward heaven. Open your hearts to the Lord. If you like to, you're welcome to kneel at your seat, but there's no expectation that you do. As we pray, O oh, righteous God, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, see me as I fall down before you. Forgive my unfaithfulness and not having done your will, for you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you shall put away all your idols. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce them all, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life. Against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin, unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God again if you would let him. Before all heaven and earth, I here acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I take you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for my portion, and vow to give up myself, body and soul, as your servant, to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. God has given the Lord Jesus Christ as the means of coming to God. Jesus, I do here on bended knees Accept Christ as the only new and living way, and sincerely join myself in a covenant with him. O oh, blessed Jesus, I come to you, hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. I do here, with all my power, accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own worthiness and vow that you are the Lord, my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only guide. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. I do here covenant with you, O Christ, to take my lot with you as it may fall. Through your grace, I promise that neither de life nor death shall part me from you. God has given holy laws as the rule of your life. I do here willingly put my neck under your yoke to carry your burden. All your laws are holy, just, and good. I therefore take them as the rule for my words thoughts and actions, promising that I will strive to order my whole life according to your direction and not allow myself to neglect anything I know to be my duty. The Almighty God searches and knows your heart. O oh God, you know that I make this covenant with you today without guile or reservation. If any falsehood should be in it, guide me and help me to set it aright. And now glory be to you, O God the Father, whom I from this day forward 
shall look upon as my God and Father. Glory be to you, O God the Son, who have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood, and now is my Savior and Redeemer. Glory be to you, O God the Holy Spirit, who by your almighty power have turned my heart from sin to God. O mighty God, the Lord Omnipotent, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend, and I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. So be it, and let the covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. I want you to take a minute, two minutes max, and go back over the words that you just said to the Lord. Circle, highlight, whatever ones are really standing out to you. Either that it's, a, it's something that's uncomfortable for you or something that God really brought your attention to that and maybe gave you extra comfort through those words. Go through and consider what God might be trying to say to you through this covenant and take a moment to pray with him about that. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. That means his suffering and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for baptism. It was a time when people who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled to the church with forgiveness and restored to the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the need that we all have to renew our faith. And so I invite you in the name of the church to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance and as a mark of our mortal nature for us to come before God tonight 
and be marked with the ashes. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and our repentance, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to ask Alan to come forward. Uh, the ushers will um, give you direction when you're, you're welcome to come forward. As you come forward tonight, bring your heart card with you. Um, and you'll come down the center aisle, and then you're welcome to kneel at the railings where Alan and I will administer the ashes. And as you receive the ashes tonight, I just want to remind you, you're not being branded by Christ. It's a choice, symbolizing the covenant that you've made with God in your heart. As a tattoo is a symbol of something important in your life that's made you who you are, receive the ashes tonight with pride. Not pride in ourselves, but in Christ, as a badge of honor that we are his. The ushers will lead you forward and bring your cards with you, if you will.
Thank you so much for this holy time. Where the noise of our lives has been um, tuned down, the volume on that has been turned down, and that we have been reminded and called back to our relationship with you, what you want for us and from us, what you offer to us, all that we have to be grateful for. We acknowledge that we have sins and we lay them before you. We don't have anything we can do about that, Lord. We just rely on your grace and say, forgive us. But help us to understand what grace really is and that it's permanent and that we no longer have to hold on to those things of the past that have been holding us back, but that we can move into a new season with you one that is marked uh, by boldness and confidence and trust and peace. We want to live up to the covenant that we have made, Lord. Help us. We also pray a blessing over this offering and ask, Lord, that you would use it for your glory here in our church, but really in our community and around the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
God for holy moments. You go from this place completely freed, new, able to walk into whatever future. I pray that you choose to have the Lord go with you, remembering that he actually goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen.